Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this very special day here online, right across Tasmania and parts of Australia as well. My name is Francis Leach, and I'm your facilitator today for Understanding the Voice, our virtual town hall, which is the start, really, of what's going to be an historic year for all Australians, Tasmanians in particular as well, as we set about discussing and hopefully passing via a referendum uh, in, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament. Thanks for joining us from wherever you are. We've got hundreds of people pouring into the meeting as we speak. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm here in Melbourne on the lands of the Boonarung people who are part of the Kulin Nation and I recognise that these lands were never ceded and pay my respects to par elders past, present and emerging. And, and to do an acknowledgement of country from where she is, uh, the person who's actually called this meeting together my boss, the wonderful Senator Anne Urquhart from Tasmania in Devonport. Anne, welcome to Understanding the Voice. How are you this afternoon? Very good, Francis. Thank you very much. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the Palawa lands from which I join you today and their connection to land, sea and community. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which each of you are joining us. And it's great to have so many here. As we share in this gathering today, may we pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Torres Strait, Islander and Aboriginal peoples. Thank you, Anne. I'm going to chat more with you in a moment, but I do want to introduce uh, our other guests today, uh, two people who are instrumental to what is going to be an historic year. I've already done uh, many, many years work on this issue and other issues when it comes to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander welfare and aspiration. Uh, firstly, a good friend of mine, somebody I work with uh, in the union movement, someone I admire enormously, Thomas Mayo is with us. Thomas is one of the drivers of From the Heart campaign, uh, a long time worker with the MUA and the CFMEU. He's the author of the wonderful book, Finding the Heart of the Nation, the journey of the Uluru Statement towards voice, treaty and truth. He's part of the government's uh, or the committee that is uh, the referendum group, which is discussing with government the shape of the legislation and, and the question. And Thomas is with us this afternoon. G'day, Thomas. Where are you uh, joining us from today? Uh, G'day, Francis. I'm on Wurundjeri country um, at the moment, still travelling around, doing my best to uh, build up the support for this campaign to, to win a referendum. You are and unstoppable at the moment. You're working seven days a week. I, I know how hard you're working on this one, as is our other guest who is with us, I think, from the Northern Territory, Northern Territory Senator and Assistant Minister for Indigenous Affairs in the Albanese Labor Government, Melandiri McCarthy, Senator for the Northern Territory. Melandiri, how are you today? Very well, Francis, and I'd like to acknowledge the Larrakia people on whose land I am coming to you all from back home here in Darwin. It was a bit of a journey to get home. Um, given some mishaps with flights and all sorts of things, but I had to get back in time to make sure I was on this uh, town hall hookup. So, so pretty much just got off the plane back from Canberra. Well, welcome home and uh, thank you for being here today. So, Anne, let's start with you before we get into some housekeeping and, and whatnot. And, and let's talk a little bit about why we called this meeting today. What was your motivation to, to have everyone come together today? You might want to unmute yourself, Anne. Yeah, the other, yeah. <laughs> it was going to happen to someone. I'm glad it happened to you. <laughs> Rookie error. Apologise for that. Um, I'm always quite confident about turning myself off, but forget to turn it on. So, well, I guess we're at an important moment in Australia's history. Uh, this process has been laid out to give First Nations people a greater say in decisions that affect them. Um, and it involves a change to the constitution that every Australian will have a chance to vote on later this year. It's a big decision, it's a huge decision, uh, but that will shape the sort of nation that we want to become. Um, and that's why I want every Tasmanian, but everyone joining us today, whether you come from Tasmania or afar, to have all the facts in front of them, uh, have the chance to ask questions and the opportunity to get on this important journey with us. Yeah, it is a journey and it is a conversation and it's one that we need to have in a spirit of uh, respect and understanding and I guess the whole theme of the voice to Parliament is listening and the power of listening and what it can do when it comes to making good decisions uh, that actually provide benefit to everyone in the community. That's at the heart of this. So that's what the discussion is going to be today, these conversations. What is the voice? Uh, why is it important? 
Um, also, how do we respond to concerns about it? Because we're in the persuasion game. We're in the persuasion game because we've got to win this referendum. That's the hard politics of it. So we need to understand who we're talking to and why and how we can work together. This is the exciting bit, how we can work together to make history. This is our chance. All of us together can do this. That's what we're on about in the next hour. And you're going to be very much involved in all of that, I'm telling you. So before we jump in, though, we have to give you some ground rules. Every meeting has ground rules, so this is my job to do that. Now, uh, we've all had enough experience in the COVID world dealing with Zoom calls, so if you can turn your camera on, it creates a nice vibe, and thank you to everybody who's already done that. Uh, but if you do, make sure you've got something on because you don't want to become that uh, meme that goes around the world because you've got a button undone or you, you know you didn't pull your pants up or something. You, know, you don't want to be that person, right? So make sure you're, you're looking okay. And uh, speaking of civility... We're using a very special feedback tool today to help us get a real understanding of what you're thinking and feeling as part of the conversation. So during the conversation and the discussion, we're going to ask you to give a specific feedback at certain times today and you can participate. So what you've got to do, if you've got your device handy, pick it up now and see that QR code in the middle of the screen. You know how to use a QR code these days. So get that QR code, take the photo, go to the Menti site uh, you can also go via your web portal, www.menti.com, and enter the code on the screen there, 61179877. Uh, so get that Menti site up, and then you can respond in time as we ask questions and, and talk about these issues. So I really encourage you to do that. So what makes this particular tool really, really special. And let's start by doing a little practice here by showing us where you are in Tassie. If you're in Tassie, you might be on the mainland, but if you're in Tassie, uh, just pick which part of the country, which, uh, which uh, Indigenous nation you are currently in, and we'll see those pop up on the screen as we go. So if, you, uh, if you're on the Menti uh, channel at the moment, we can see them popping up now. Look at that, <laughs> little dots appearing all over Tasmania and beyond as we speak. So that's an indication of where we're hearing and seeing people uh, today. But uh, it's an exciting time to be having this discussion. So let's also take a bit of a temperature test here using the Menti uh, platform here. And you can just use one word if you're uh, part of this today. How would you say you feel about Australia right now? Uh, what word would describe your, your general feeling about the current state of affairs in the country? And we'd like to get a sense from you what that looks like. And you'll see that word map uh, pop up, as you can see, as we have this conversation. And I might start that conversation now uh, with Thomas. Thomas, you've been giving a lot of your time to this campaign, as we've uh, said earlier. But how would you gen feel generally heading into this massive year about where we're headed with this particular campaign and the important historic opportunity that's ahead of us? Yeah, thanks, Francis. I'm feeling really hopeful uh, is the word that I'd use to describe how I feel about Australia right now. Um, there's been so much work done by so many people to bring us to an opportunity where we're going to be able to have some structural change that finally includes Indigenous people uh, and recognises us. So I'm feeling very hopeful, mate. And Senator McCarthy, Melangiri, what about yourself? What are your general feelings as we sort of uh, head into a really important year? How would you, what word would you use? And, and tell us a little bit about how you are feeling in relation to the wider community sentiment when it comes to the voice. Look, I'm like Thomas, uh, very hopeful, clearly very optimistic. I think that this is a, an historic opportunity, Francis, for our country, for all Australians. Uh, to do something significant and important uh, for the future of uh, all Australians. But, you know, and I look at my kids and think, well, I want something for them, you know, and um, just to let your viewers know, they'll be hanging around with me. <laughs> but, you know, that's what it's about, right? It's for, our, it's for future generations of Australians and uh, better interaction with First Nations people and non-Indigenous people, but also about policies that impact First Nations people that they oh have a say. Yeah, and I guess, you know, just having your kids there brings it back to the core thing, doesn't it? We can talk about uh, the debate around the importance of the voice and the issues that it throws up. But in the end, it's about improving the quality of life for, for those that, uh, that, that uh, are, you know, are the next generation and, you know, and, the, and real outcomes for real people. Absolutely, Francis. And, you know, we look at closing the gap and each year it... Uh, it's very slow in the progress. We've seen a couple of uh, targets that are looking good, uh, but the rest are, are really quite difficult and challenging. And we do see that uh, what we've tried obviously isn't working overall. And the strength of the work, as Thomas has said, that's been done uh, in this journey for over 10 years or more, 
uh, in terms of the lead up to this referendum says that this is our opportunity. This is our chance to change it for the better. Okay, so let's get into the nuts and bolts of what the voice is going to be and how it might look. But before we do that, we want to head back to you out there by using the Menti app here and just get a sense of how much you do or don't actually understand about where the voice is at. So uh, you can uh, have a look at this uh, uh, question here and maybe give us a sense. Do you strongly agree that you understand what the voice is about or do you disagree? Do you think that there's still gaps in your own knowledge about where it sits at the moment? And we'll come back to this question later as well after we've had this conversation. But yeah, maybe jump on the Menti tool there and let us know where you're feeling at the moment about your understanding of the issues and the importance of what the voice is. But I do want to start with you, Anne, because this is fundamentally a constitutional question that we're talking about. And we need to go back to first principles here. What is the constitution and why does it matter? So, I'll, I'll, you know, as somebody who sits uh, in, in the, I like to call the principal's office of the Senate, basically directing <laughs> to like the front office at the school there, <laughs> runs the Senate chamber, you can tell us what the constitution is and why it matters. I think sometimes the school office might be a bit easier, Francis, but anyway, I love what I do. So the Constitution, this is the Constitution. I'm not sure whether people can see it, but it is um, a very small little tiny booklet, and that's what, that's what it is. So really what this is is the founding document of our nation uh, and preeminent source of law in the country. The Constitution sets down the powers of each of our three branches of governance. That is the Parliament, the Executive, and the courts. So the constitution outlines how the federal um, and state parliament share power and roles of the executive government in the High Court of Australia. It took effect on the 1st of January, 1901. There was no mention of First Nations people in that constitution that took effect on the 1st of January, 1901. No mention at all. Aboriginal people were not mentioned in the constitution until 1967. A 1967 referendum was where Australians voted overwhelmingly to amend the constitution and allow the Commonwealth to make laws for Aboriginal people and include them in the census. So 1967, I mean, it seems like a bit of a way, away, you know, a long time ago, but really it's, it's quite... Uh, it's quite recent when you think about the fact that this document was first put up in 1901 and it took 66 years before Aboriginal people were recognised within this, this important document. And in 1967, that referendum put a question to the Australian people. And in summary, that question was, do you approve the proposed law for the alteration of the constitution so that Aboriginals are to be counted in reckoning the population? And of course, we know if we look back through history, that referendum was successful. And we now had that inserted into the constitution. I am, I am hopeful, I am working very hard to make sure that the 2023 referendum delivers the same outcome, which means a change in this, this little document. And it's beautifully put there in terms of the timeline there. And Thomas, I want to go to you on this because I, I heard uh, one Aboriginal elder talk about this uh, and say that in 1967, uh, Aboriginal people won the right to be counted and 50 years on, more than 50 years on, we are now asking for the right to be heard. And, and that's a significant difference, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's a, a, the next step forward. You know, um, we are uh, recognised... Uh, we're counted as Australian citizens, um, though we're yet to be heard. Uh, and that's reflected, I think, in the statistics that, um, you know, show our life expectancy to be around 10 years less, uh, the incarceration rates, you know, all those measures that Malandiri mentioned that um, the gap that isn't closing. Um, and, and they have very much to do, not with, I think the Uluru statement is, importantly says that proportionately we're the most incarcerated people on the planet but we're not an innately criminal people our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates this cannot be because we have no love for them it's pointing out that this is a matter of our voicelessness in this country uh, not a matter of um, who we are or, or our humanity 
And we do need to sort of talk about the nuts and bolts of the change that they're looking for here. And, and I might bring Melendiri in on this as well, uh, as well as you, Thomas, because we need to change the constitution. And, and that means, Senator McCarthy, that we need a majority of votes in a majority of states. So it's very different to say a federal election or a by-election that we used to, because we, well, the last, last referendum of note was the, uh, the constitutional uh, referendum in relation to the Republic. And that was over 20 years ago. So, you know, we maybe need to go back to school to understand what needs to be done here. Uh, look, I totally agree, Francis. I think a lot of us need to learn and I'm actually enjoying the learning. It, you know, so much has changed uh, in a couple of years, let alone 20 years. So for, for those uh, people online, you know, the last time we had a referendum over 20 years ago, there was certainly no social media, for example. Uh, there was certainly no ability uh, to be able to vote in different ways. COVID showed us that uh, you can you could vote by phone, but also we've had with uh, general elections, a couple of weeks of voting uh, opportunities before the actual voting day. So it requires some changes, Francis, to the actual piece of legislation around having referendums. So there's some technical aspects that we have to deal with in the parliament, even before we get to the uh, legislation around what the question will be for a referendum. So it's exciting for those of us who like kind of the constitutional stuff, but it's also just a lot of uh, just a lot of work that's got to be done. Uh, that's fairly uh, mundane, but very serious work. And I just want to go back to you as well before we uh, move on, because we do need to remind people that you know, Tasmania has a pivotal role to play in this because, you know, it, it's got to be the majority of votes in the majority of states. So yeah. Tasmania could be the swing state in that sense. Absolutely. Couldn't it? So, yeah. so yeah. Tasmanians yeah. have a huge responsibility. Yeah, we do. We have a really huge responsibility. And I mean, changes to the constitution are not easy. They're not easily obtained. So, you know, the, a referendum has special rules and those special rules are that a referendum is only passed if it is approved by a majority of voters across the nation, as well as a majority of voters in a majority of states. So this is known as a double majority. So even if we win in Tassie um, and another state doesn't, you know, we, we need to make sure that we've got the majority of voters across the nation and a majority of voters in the majority of states. So territory voters are only counted in the national majority. So they're not they're not counted in as a state uh, body is, but they're counted in the national majority. So that's where Tasmania is going to be vitally important to make sure that we get it over the line here so that we are counted as one of the majority states. And then obviously, of course, if the referendum is then successful, then the change is then made to the constitution through that process. But I guess I cannot underestimate how important this is for Tasmanians to, first of all, have an understanding of what they're voting on. And we've heard a lot of uh, rhetoric about, you know, detail and all this sort of stuff, information, a whole lot of things. It is a very simple principle. And I know that Mel and Deary and perhaps Thomas will talk about this later, but it, it, it is vitally important that we get out and, and talk to people because that is the way that we will... Um, put some of the misconceptions to to uh, to bed, I think. Uh, and just to, add to that, go ahead, Francis, Melinda, sorry. just to add to Anne there, that uh, just a reminder to, to our viewers online that we've had 44 referendums and only eight have been won. So we know that this statistically is a tough road ahead of us, but we're so firmly of the view that Australians of good hearts and minds will see that this is a really important referendum to say yes to. And Melinda, it is a question about constitutional change, isn't it? it, it the, the sort of design features of what came out of the Uluru Statement from the Heart was to ask people uh, about uh, changing the constitution to establish a voice to parliament. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how that works? Look, I know that Thomas has the experience of the actual journey, but I guess it, I can speak from the point of view of, so for me personally, I'm a Yanua Gaibal woman. I come from a place called Barulula in the Gulf of Carpentaria and have seen over so many decades, even before coming into parliament, uh, the, the difficulties of not being able to have a voice or a seat at the table and what the uh, Uluru Statement came up with was really, you know, the proposition for the voice 
is quite simple. You know, that First Nations people should have a say in the laws and the policies that affect their lives and communities. So it's really that simple. And I think, uh, Francis, I suppose I digress a bit, but I guess where the, the, the debate has gone is into more detail. But I think I ask your viewers online to realise that this is actually quite a simple request. Um, and I hope that people can learn that through this process this afternoon. Well, Thomas, you, as Melandiri said, have been on this journey for a very long time. And from that now famous meeting that, uh, that happened at Uluru, tell us a little bit about the, the process that was involved in coming to this position and just how detailed and heartfelt and the deep thinking that went into the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is a piece of Australian poetry and that everybody, I think, should read. It should be on, it should be on syllabuses all around the country. But, I mean, there was a lot of work that went into that and I'm sure there was a lot of uh, toing and froing. So give us a sense of what that was like. Yeah, Francis, I'll, I'll deep dive into that a bit and I hope I don't go too long. I'll be as brief as possible. But really, um, the Uluru Statement uh, and each of the proposals voice uh, constitutionally enshrined voice and a Makarata Commission for Treaties, for treaties um, really used, took the lessons from the past, you know, took, a, took the many lessons that we've learned from a, a long history of struggle. And it was 13 regional dialogues, uh, but I, I should take a step back there. The, the dialogues were run by the Referendum Council and that came about from a meeting that happened at Kirribilli House in 2015, where the Kirribilli statement was made. And this meeting was called by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders in a crisis where the gap was widening terribly. And the meeting was with the Prime Minister of the time and the opposition leader. And they made the Kirribilli statement, which said two things. It said, firstly, when it comes to constitutional recognition, um, we would prefer rather than symbolic constitutional recognition, a form of recognition that gives us some substantive, um, that, that gives greater fairness. And secondly, they proposed that a ref the referendum council be formed um, to go to the communities and to broader Australia and have the conversation, um, to have a deliberative process to find what form of recognition indigenous people and the Australian people would support. Now, those 13 regional dialogues came from the Referendum Council being formed. It was 50% Indigenous leaders, 50% non-Indigenous. And they did great work to design these three-day dialogues all around the country. And those three-day dialogues had intense lessons on civics for the participants. Um, there was a formula to get a cross-section of our views, not just the loudest of our people, but also the quieter people in our communities, the healers, um, you know, not just the activists. Um, to get that, that, that proper range of, uh, of perspectives and understandings and, and experiences. Um, there was uh, lessons on the history of our struggle, the things that we tried, the many statements and petitions um, that we've had that have been dismissed outright, the many statements and petitions that called for a voice that were ignored, the many times we've established voices in the past, but when hostile governments have come along, they've silenced it because they don't want to be made uncomfortable about the poor decisions they've obviously made um, about our communities and our lives. Um, these dialogues also elected delegates to take the record of meeting, the accurate record of meeting to the heart of the country in Uluru. And, and our job as delegates, I was one of them, was to synthesize the results uh, of each of the dialogues and try and bring it together in one common statement. That was our great hope. Uh, we came together and, and it was a lot of passionate debate and discussion. Uh, we're no different from any other human group. We have, we have our different positions, our different ideas, different political ideologies even. But there was a lot of passionate debate and discussion and a great, great majority of us at Uluru um, stood as one and endorsed the Uluru Statement from the Heart that had been worked on through the night into the early hours of the morning, stood as one and endorsed it with standing acclamation. And you see, this, this process of the making of the Uluru Statement and coming up with that priority proposal, which is to constitutionally enshrine a voice, um, really does give this great legitimacy, you know, what we're trying to do here. Because it is what Indigenous people have invited all Australians 
to walk with us to achieve. Yes, it's a wonderful document. And if you haven't read it, I do recommend heartily that you read and share it with your friends. It's a, it's a piece of Australian poetry. It's a, it literally is from the heart and it is a roadmap to a better future. And I want you to ask us questions. I mean, you can in the chat, the chat room there. So if you've got some questions, fire them through. Our te civility tech team are, are doing all the back end stuff, making this look uh, very slick. Uh, they'll, they'll put it in there for us to, to ask those questions to our guests and uh, we can have that conversation as well as using the app we've got as well. So Mel and Jerry, just, just on that, as we move to the why part of this question, why the voice? You know, one of the things we hear is, oh, what practical outcomes can come from having a voice to parliament and, and why would that matter? So I'm gonna throw that to you and say, how does the voice to parliament uh, actually result in better outcomes, not only for uh, uh, First Nations communities, but I, I know I'm gonna be ambitious and say for all of Australia. Okay, look, I might take it back to uh, a bit of a closer personal point and, and example, Francis, and it might be a little bit lengthy, so just bear with me. When uh, I came into the federal parliament in 2016 with Linda Burney and Pat Dodson, we were really uh, very aware that the caucus, and we have a caucus which determines and decides uh, the positions that we're going to take as a party going into the parliament. And they had smaller caucuses like Country Caucus, the Women's Caucus, uh, Economics Caucus, but there wasn't really a official First Nations caucus. And so we knew that we needed to have a voice in the decision making of our caucus when we came up against pieces of legislation uh, that went to the parliament. So we established the First Nations Caucus in a very formal sense. There were informal times over the years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sort of subcommittees, but this was the actual formalisation of a First Nations Caucus, a First Nations voice uh, in the decision-making process. And so we established that in 2016 and were then able to, through that process, and it didn't mean just Linda, Pat and I in there, it was also about uh, other representatives in the caucus who wanted to know more about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs, who also represented Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and could give uh, input to pieces of legislation. So that's a small example of how our voices have considerably impacted and influenced the decision of the Federal Labor Party uh, in taking the policies that we did to the election uh, and the policies where we are. Now, that's one example at a political level what the Uluru Statement talks about is the grassroots and the families and communities out there who don't want to be politicians. They just want to be able to speak for their clan groups. And I come from an area where we have four clan groups, the Yanua, Gardua, Mara and Guranji, and I know they would like to have their voices heard, but they don't want to be a part of a party to do that, whether it's Labor, Liberal, Nationals, Independent, Greens. Why can't they have their own voice to help influence uh, decisions. So really, that's how I view it, Francis. I think that the parallel journey that our First Nations caucus was travelling and then the Uluru statement came along and we supported it all the way and have carried that flame in the parliament right up until this day. I just know that this is the way forward. And Anne, I guess it's a generous invitation that stems from the Uluru Statement from the heart, which is so powerful, uh, that is a really exciting opportunity for, for all of Australia to participate in and to change the shape of our nation. I guess as Noel Pearson said, uh, recognition without repudiation is a, a brilliant way to describe it and just how exciting we should see this as an opportunity. You might want to unmute yourself, Anne. <laughs> Sorry, so I'm following the rules too well, aren't I? Um, I, I, I think it is a, um, it's a huge opportunity, but it's also, I think, uh, a huge responsibility for, um, you know, Australians and Tasmanians to be involved in this. But how exciting is it that we have an opportunity to be able to provide that voice? And, you know, I think Thomas and Mal and Deary are much better, you know, um, they have they have more understanding of you know the need for that voice, but I think we need to recognise that from our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and and respect it. And I think this is to me a show of respect to people who haven't had a voice for a very long time, um, and that is what they're asking. And I think that is not a big ask. And I think we need to recognise that that it is recognition, but it's also us all walking together. And I think. 
from my point of view, that makes a better country and it makes a nicer country for all of us to live in. Thomas, just, uh, you know, on the issue of, you know, the diversity within Indigenous communities itself, we've got a question here. There are, you know, hundreds of differences of Aboriginal nations with their own beliefs and questions, uh, questions about the world and, and goals and, and values. You talked about the synthesis that came together through those regional dialogues. But how, how can we be sure that a voice can effectively represent all of those voices? Yeah, so it's about, when we talk about a national voice and what a voice would say to the federal parliament, it's really about those things that are common across our communities. So the voice would not seek to speak for anyone else's country uh, or for those issues that are unique on that country or even to um, a particular treaty negotiation in a state um, or you know, if there is a, um, a nation to state type uh, treaty. Uh, it would speak on common issues such as um, housing, uh, the justice system, uh, infrastructure, the way programs are run in communities. Um, there's a whole lot of things that are common across all Indigenous communities and for all Indigenous peoples. And the voice would make a, a, a great difference in those matters. Um, it would also be the means for Indigenous people, even though we have, as you said, different languages, different cultures um, and, and, uh, and different practices, we also have many similarities in our culture as well. And we do also all share that long connection to this country. And so there'll be ability, the ability for us to also act in support of each other um, when there are challenges on each other's, in, a, in each other's country. Um, this, this is a really important uh, practical reason why uh, this, this voice should be established and, and protected and guaranteed in the constitution. Uh, because it affects all of those things. And that's why um, it is said that many of the issues that we're suffering in our communities at the moment, if there was a voice uh, some time ago, that these issues would not be as bad because we would have been influencing the, the, the policies and the laws um, and the inconsistencies of how programs and funding happens in our communities. Um, and, and it would have made a, a great difference in our people's lives. We're getting lots of questions coming through the chat. I'm going to try and filter them through as we go, but uh, we've also got some other things to cover. Before we do move on, one more question, Mel and Jerry. There is a few people have asked, more simply, just get back to the core politics of this as well. Uh, what's, what's the question that's going to be put at the referendum? I know we can't speak for the Prime Minister or the legislation that's to come, but we do have a framework of sorts around that, don't we, around what, what the basic ask is going to be for constitutional change that you know then sends it off to the parliament to decide the sort of the granular detail of what, uh, what the uh, voice actually looks like in practicality. I've got it yes, here. No, Thomas has got it there. <laughs> Do you want it? Have you got it? Thomas, great. You've got yeah, it? Yeah. Yep. So, so in, in August last year at the Gama Festival on Yolnu country in Arnhem Land, the Prime Minister uh, provided us for our national discussion um, a draft question and a draft provision. Um, so the draft question is what will be asked of us at the referendum and our answer can be yes or no. Uh, and the provision is what will be inserted inserted into the constitution. It's the alteration to the constitution. The question um, at present, and it's unlikely to change much, but we are working it through and a decision will be made very, very soon. Um, it says, do you support an alteration to the constitution that establishes an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice? It's that simple. Um, the provision, would you like me to read that as well? Might as well, yeah, go yeah. right ahead, Thomas. So, and this is where, you know, um, Senator Anne was, was saying how simple this is, uh, and, and Mal and Deary. It is quite a simple change we're talking about here. It's not, um, the, the detail question, this, this debate about detail is being put forward by those that want to confuse Australians, uh, or by a lot of them to confuse Australians. It's not that there isn't a desire to know more, but some are just seeking to confuse. But what's important for people to keep in mind is this is all that, this is pretty much the totality of the change. In recognition of Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, one, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to parliament and the executive government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, and finally, 
the parliament shall subject to this constitution have the power to make laws with respect to the composition, functions, powers, and procedures of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. So the, the final words are likely to be pretty close to that. Um, it's, it establishes the principle that there should be a voice to speak to the parliament about the matters that affect us and how the voice works is in legislation because that would need to change over time, just like all organisations need to evolve with the needs of the people and to improve and for the national interest. Thanks for that, Thomas. So let's have a look at how you're feeling about things now. So we know if you look at most polls and aggregate of polls at the moment, a lot of Australians are feeling the same way. We know that it's currently generally public support for the voices around 65 to 35. It's a great place to start the two horse race. So we're, we're off to a good start, but we'd like to know what are the reasons that, that are most compelling for you at the moment, uh, getting back to the civility tech app uh, on, on Menti there, have a look at some of the uh, some of the arguments that we're making and let us know which ones are more most compelling for you in terms terms of the arguments that you might want to take out to your community and friends as well when you have these conversations uh, with them to explain why the voice is important and why they should vote yes when the referendum comes around uh, in, a, in a couple of months or at the end of the year. Um, uh, just looking at, at those arguments there, Anne, I mean, uh, you've, you've been prosecuting this case as well for, for a long time. It's, uh, they're all strong pillars, aren't they, for us to take to the community, to people who don't spend their time thinking about politics and these issues, to get them engaged on, on what matters most when it comes to this referendum. Absolutely. And um, look, I think that's the, the key is that we need to make sure that people who are out in the community understand exactly what they're going to be voting on in the referendum. And, you know, it is a simple principle, as both Thomas and Melandiri have outlined. And the detail of the, the you know, some of the, some of the um, particularly um, you know, the coalition and that have been peddling is that, oh, you know, we want to see more detail. That detail will be determined in the bill that goes to Parliament. That's where, that's the right place. So when we talk about the Constitution, this little book that I held up earlier, that has a section in it. Chapter four is on finance and trade. So finance is covered, tax, the tax laws are covered in here, but the detail of the tax is not covered in here. That's covered in a law under uh, a bill in Parliament. It's the same with the army. The army is outlined in, in the constitution, but it doesn't say where it shall be based. It doesn't talk about how many people should be in the army. That is a bill that is then, the detail of all that is then put through the parliament. So I think the message that, you know, everybody, um, you know, that's listening, if, if people start talking about detail, we're talking about a very principled position and it is a very easy principle, and that is will, will we insert the voice into the, into the constitution? The detail then comes uh, so many days as a, a process in place for how, how this works, um, is that if that question then is yes, um, then the work is then done by the parliament introducing a bill to exactly outline the detail of that and there will be lots of opportunities for people to, uh, you know, have a look at that. I'm sure there will be an inquiry through the parliament. Um, but I think that the basic thing here for people to clearly understand is that we are talking about a question, a principle, and not the level of detail that others are, are proposing they want to know now. We are in a, the persuasion business, as I said. This is a, a referendum where there will be two sides, and we are going, you know, to conduct this debate and discussion over the next year in a tone of respect and civility that's the way you get the best outcomes in any situation and part of what we have to do is listen to the concerns of those who are either undecided about the voice to parliament who are currently you know entrenched in their position that they're against it so we need to unpack some of their arguments have a look at them and discuss how we respond and, and let's let's do that now and we might get you to jump back into the civility app here and just have a look at some of the key themes in the, in the no case that have been thrown around here at the moment and uh, whether any of these ring true for you or whether you think they're strong arguments and you know they, we need to be honest about how what people are saying about uh, the campaign and how it's going to unfold because by understanding people's concerns we'll get better at arguing our case and to win the battle and of ideas which is what we're in so and i guess you know as a parliamentarian and someone who's heavily involved in the procedural elements of the parliamentary life. Um, the idea that you know, giving a, a Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people a voice to parliament is creating a third chamber of parliament and therefore disrupting the flow of our democracy as we know it. What do you make of that? 
It's absolute rubbish, to be honest. Um, I mean, this is some of the stuff that we've heard, you know, about a third chamber. And in fact, you know, I was talking to um, one of the mayors along the northwest coast here just a couple of weeks ago who said, oh, you know, she was very well versed on the um, on the voice, but in fact didn't agree with the third chamber. And I thought, well, you know, how well voiced are you? Um, and so, you know, we had a discussion and sort of set her on the on the right path. But, you know, that's the sort of stuff that we're, you know, people in leadership roles need to play this sort of leadership in terms of getting people to understand what we're talking about. It's not a third chamber. That is just absolute rubbish. We are talking about, as I said before, a principle of a voice. And then those that voice will be a collective of, of people that are, are selected by, um, I guess, the First Nations people who will then provide that information to people like me and others who are, and Malandiri, who are actually sitting in the federal parliament. It's, it's a little bit the same as when we do an inquiry on a particular issue in the Senate. We have Senate inquiries. We go out and we talk to uh, people on all walks of life. Um, I did a, a first responders inquiry a few years ago now, and we went out and we talked to people who were involved in the first responders industry. We talked to people who were, uh, you know, had knowledge about that. But we didn't sit them in a third chamber we took their evidence, we listened to them, and we tried to change the, the way in which, um, you know, legislation and things are done to try and help those people. That's the sort of similar thing we're talking about. So we, we need to, I think, as quickly as we can, um, you know, put to bed this nonsense that people are, are sort of saying about a third chamber. And I think that's why it's important to, you know, get people uh, to be armed with, as you know, the information that that we, they need, but but to keep it simple. I love the KISS principle, um, and I think that's really important in making sure that people understand things is to make it easy for people to have that conversation. And, you know, I think that's what we, we want people to do is to go and talk to at least two or three other people um, about, you know, what this means, um, because then that can make the real difference when they go to put pen to paper when they are voting on the referendum. Alan Deary, the, the other argument we hear from, from some is that if you were to agree to a voice to Parliament, it undermines Aboriginal uh, claims to sovereignty in Australia. And that confuses some people uh, when they hear that, thinking that they might be doing a disservice to Indigenous communities by voting yes. I would certainly say to people who ask that question that definitely no. Uh, First Nations people have never ceded sovereignty to Australia. Mm -hmm and uh, they certainly haven't under the current uh, constitution and they certainly aren't doing it through uh, wanting to establish a voice in the constitution. So uh, we've had uh, people who uh, still want to cause a bit of confusion in that area and I would uh, say to your uh, listeners and people online, uh, you know, again, I certainly would never uh, want to see that happen. Thomas would never be a part of that and neither would any of those uh, First Nations people in the Uluru Statement. Uh, so, so please know that that's a categorical no, uh, and when it is thrown out there, it's usually thrown out there to cause distraction and confusion. And similarly, Thomas, the, the issue around uh, voice before treaty, uh, or you know, the importance of treaty, no one is dismissing the importance of treaty and truth in a longer process that this is. This isn't, this, uh, voice to parliament issue is not the end of the journey, is it? And I guess that's one of the questions that gets thrown up as well, that treaty should come before voice. Um, but what's the response from, from someone who's been in, involved in this process from the first conversation to today? Yeah, there are some that are saying a treaty must exclusively come before a voice. Uh, and some of those people are just seeking to um, to confuse, just like the other end of the other extreme of politics, um, they're using that as a tactic to confuse. It's the best way to respond to it, though, is with logic. Um, you, the, the sequence that we came up with at Uluru uh, is to prioritise trying to, uh, to establish the voice because we need the voice to be able to um, uh, speak to the federal government about their obligations to treaties that are already underway. Uh, in the states, in many of the states and territories. Uh, Tasmania, uh, even with the Liberal government now, has uh, committed to a treaty process. Um, and so treaties are, are underway. 
Uh, another really important thing about that is that treaties are likely to take many decades. The most advanced treaty process is gone for over 10 years now in Victoria, and they're not even at the point of a log of claims. Um, and this is no one's fault. It's just a, a, a very, very complex thing uh, over 200 years after first contact. Um, and so we need to establish a voice to begin the work of improving the lives of our people now without waiting decades for an unknown outcome in a treaty. Uh, and so that logic is really important to consider when you hear that. Another question for you, Thomas, coming through from uh, our, our people who are online today, and we thank you for hanging with us. It's been a great conversation. Um, are there other examples around the world uh, of First Nations people and Indigenous communities establishing a voice or having an arrangement that gives them, uh, you know, an extra voice within the uh, parliamentary or democratic process in, the, in countries that we can learn a little bit from? Yeah, there's in the, uh, the, the Sami people of Scandinavian countries have the Sami parliament. Uh, there are First Nations assemblies um, in other countries. We're actually um, quite, uh, we're quite behind, we're quite backwards in Australia. Um, we've got a lot of catching up to do uh, because not only does Australia, um, compared to like countries, uh, are we the only one without a treaty with its Indigenous peoples, but we're also the only one without constitutional recognition of Indigenous peoples compared to like countries. New Zealand doesn't have a written constitution, though it has a founding, founding documents and the Treaty of Waitangi is one of them, which basically gives them recognition. Okay, there's been a lot to take in here, but we do want to do a bit of a temperature check, see how you're all feeling. And, uh, and then we're going to talk about how you can be more involved in, in making this happen, because it's going to take all of us. It's not going to be done by politicians. That's the first thing we've got to understand in all of this. It's us that are going to make the difference. So after what you've heard, uh, do you agree that you understand the voice better now? Do you support the voice campaign? And just as importantly, as I said, would you be actively campaigning for the voice? Are you prepared to, you know, as Barack Obama said, lace up your shoes and get out there? If you're going to change, it's going to be door to door, uh, person to person, conversation to conversation. So give us a sense from the Menti app how you're feeling and uh, and what today has brought to your understanding of uh, where we are and what we need to do. Um, so how do we harness the enthusiasm, team? <laughs> Mel and Deary, I'll start with you. Uh, what, what do you think people should be doing uh, when it comes to you know, being involved this year and helping to move the country towards a position where we have a wonderful historic moment and establish an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament. Thanks, Francis. I think this is a people's movement. You know, Thomas and all of those who uh, did so much work in the lead up to Uluru and beyond, uh, this is a people's movement, Francis, and I think it's engagements like this uh, where they can be small engagements online, uh, constant conversations in your workplace, coffee shops, down the street, supermarkets, at the footy, with your kids at coach, you know, with, you know, with other parties, with, you know, in terms of uh, birthday parties, I don't mean political parties, but political parties would be great. But I just think it's a people's movement, you know, and I do believe that it's, it's about Australians feeling it in themselves, that this is the way to go. And those of us who are in Parliament, whether at the federal level or state and territory, we know that at the end of the day, when people go to the ballot box, uh, the people speak the truth. And in Tasmania, a special job, as we spoke about earlier, with the Tassie being so crucial to the success of this referendum. I mean, I know next this coming week, uh, there's going to be a whole range of activities that you'll be involved in and your team will be involved in across the northwest of Tasmania, where you're based, just to start that conversation. Absolutely. And I mean, I guess we're a bit of a rare breed down here in Tassie because we have a... Um, um, we, we have a, a Liberal government, but we also have a Premier who is very, very uh, passionate and very wedded to the voice. I think that's fantastic because, you know, people showing leadership like that provides the opportunity for some of those on the other side of politics, for me, that, you know, this is not, this is not a bad thing uh, when you've got someone like that doing it. We're doing lots of work. I mean, there's lots of things people can do down here. You can have your kitchen table conversations, as we call them, have a chat at the pub with your mates if you're out having a quiet drink. Um, you know, we've got mobile offices scheduled for uh, all the um, uh, major sort of centres along the northwest coast and down the west coast this week, this coming week. So we'll have 
uh, basically a street stall with a lot of information about the voice on it for people. And, and we want to have those conversations because I think that's the important thing about, you know, clearing up the, the misinformation that's out there. Obviously, social media is a really good opportunity and we'll be doing lots of that and, you know, sharing that around people is really good as well. You do get some negative feedback, but there's always a, you know, a, a hide button if it's too vile. But uh, generally, you know, I, I guess we want to get really active and we are starting to get really active. This is just the start for us here. Um, you know, things like today, you know, we may repeat this. I've already had requests to do that. So there's lots of activity. Um, and that activity is really about just making sure that we talk to as many people as we can um, and, and talk to them about exactly what they're, what this is about and giving them the correct information. That's the really important thing for me at the start of this journey. And I will say at this point, this particular conversation is being recorded. It will be up on Anne's YouTube channel and, and elsewhere. So uh, you'll be able to find it and share it with uh, people as well. And if people were planning to come that you know but couldn't make it, maybe you want to share it with them too. Thomas, you've got your uh, campaign up and running from the heart. Um, tell people about that and, and what the, 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 uh, the particular focus is there and how they might be able to get involved. Yeah, so um, From the Heart is a campaign uh, for the Yes Folk. Um, it's uh, through Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition uh, that now has DGR status to, um, to fundraise for the campaign. Uh, it, it really is about um, helping others to, to support this campaign. Other organisations, there'll be a Yes Alliance, um, which is launching uh, to, um, the next week on Thursday evening. Um, we'll, be, we'll have our logos out there, our shirts uh, and all this new, uh, all these new campaign materials to help um, us really um, be very visible in our support. And that's going to make a big difference in this as well. Um, so keep your eye out for that. Um, and talked about the, um, the kitchen tables together. Yes, um, that's going to be a really important thing um, for everybody to jump on and help out too. I just saw a, um, Francis, a, a point there that's, uh, raised in the questions about um, coalition uh, is all over the place and there's a concern that you know beyond the referendum they might uh, seek to um, to take uh, the voice away but um, I just want to say that through this referendum it really gives it a strong mandate from the Australian people to all parliaments that the voice should be respected and heard so I hope that addresses that concern. Thanks, Thomas. And Melanie, just again, so that people can get a sense of the timeline, when the legislation is going to be in Parliament and just the mechanics of what follows on from that, because it is a, a multi-stage process to, to getting to voting day for a referendum, isn't it? Get my mute off. Sorry, I had my mute on. Um, yes, it is. But look, what I would say to uh, people who are online, uh, get yourself on the roll. I know they sound it sounds really basic, but here, up, certainly up in the Northern Territory, we've got so many people to still enrol and right across Northern Australia, it's critical that everyone has a chance to have their voice heard uh, at the ballot box in particular. And if we can get as many people to say yes across the states, especially there in Tassie, we're gonna be relying very heavily on you, given here in the Territory, we only have half a vote. Okay, well, uh, we're almost at the end of our conversation today. As I said, uh, if you go into the chat, there is also a link to Thomas's From the Heart campaign to find out more. We will be making this available again, as a, I guess as a teaching tool, really, if people want to share it with people who want to get their head inside what the voice is all about. Um, we, we will be able to send materials out, uh, the T-shirt, Melandiri. Everyone wants to know where they get their T-shirt from, so you might as well tell us now because I know you're getting inquiries. Yeah, look, I, I did try and answer on the chat there, um, Francis, but it's um, it's Sally Scales, uh, an amazing young woman from Anangu area, Pitinjara, and she, she's the artist, and uh, she certainly is with uh, she works with uh, Megan Davis and Pat Anderson. So we'll get the details and see if we can uh, send the link on on the line there for everyone. And yeah. see if they can get a, get a copy it's, of the it's, shirt. It's through the Sorry, iconic. Yeah. Sorry, Thomas. Uh, the iconic, I think, is the the website that you can buy it from. Yeah. So if we get the link and put it up for everyone. Yeah, that'd be no great. Worries. I'll sell out in no time. Uh, one final thing before we go: um, if you are comfortable, we'd love to understand a little more about you, your age. 
uh, gender and postcode as well. We're not collecting your emails for anything here in political terms. This is not about using your data to sell or to uh, sell you some timeshare or anything like that. But we are just trying to understand the diversity of views around the state um, and make sure that we get a sense of uh, where people are, what they're thinking, and uh, we can build a better campaign that way. So if you're comfortable sharing that information on your phone just now, that'd be great. I, I just want to thank everyone who's been involved today. I want to thank everyone who's come online because it is Saturday afternoon <laughs> and where I am, the sun's shining at least. Maybe it is for everybody and you could be out doing all sorts of stuff, but you've made the effort to be here. Uh, and, and firstly, Mel and Jerry, do we have a win in the basketball today? That's just as important. Let's go around the grounds. <laughs> they played very well. They played for the Eagles. They've got my three daughters here, so they played really well and they were very excited to to see me back from Canberra. So thanks for letting me have them in here for this today. Well, we appreciate, we appreciate you uh, being on to us, with us when you could have uh, also been at the basketball. Thomas, thank you so much. I know how hard you are working um, uh, every waking moment to make this happen, and we're with you all the way, my friend, and uh, it's the start of an important journey. Thank you, Francis. Oh, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming on and listening. Uh, believe in yourselves. You know, believe that we can do this uh, because we can, and um, and let's get it done. Thank you. And 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 uh, great to have you. And thank you, Anne Urquhart, for setting this up and putting in all the work to make this happen today. It's the first of a whole bunch of events that will happen around the country like this. But you are the pioneer, Senator. You're the one that did this before anyone else, and uh, and everyone's now got to try and follow your lead, which ain't easy. Thanks, Francis. And just before I go, um, just this morning when I was checking my emails, I got an, e an email from uh, a gentleman in um, Hobart called Rex Beamish. And he said that he wasn't a Zoomer by inclination, so he wouldn't join, but he did say that he wanted to offer something that could add to the discussion. And he attached a poem. And I just want to read the first five lines of that poem, and I'm going to put it up on my Facebook and we might share it um, in other places as well. So it said, once more is the name. In 1967, I was 14 and proud. My nation had made a choice. Aboriginal people would be counted in the Aussie crowd. Now at 70, we are being asked to hear their voice, to hear our, our Indigenous kin, to listen and understand the story they tell. His poem goes on, but I just thought that was a lovely way to capture the sentiments of what he wrote. He certainly does. Thank you for, for bringing that to the table as well. And once again, I've just been asked by our civility team, uh, yeah, the data stuff. If you've got, uh, when we go back to the, the slide that we've put up there, uh, if you've got the opportunity to give us a sense of your postcode and where you're from and all that sort of stuff, um, that'd be great because it'll help us build a stronger campaign. So that's uh, really important too. It's the first step on a journey that we're all going to be part of and we've all got to do it together. And when we do, and we will, we will have changed Australia for the better. And if you do one thing in your life, what could be better than that? Thank you so much for being here today. Um, talk to your friends, your family, uh, have those conversations. And from the Understanding of the Voice Town Hall, my name is Francis Leach, saying goodbye for now and uh, walk on. Thanks, Francis. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everybody. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs>